Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's uh, function. Uh, we, Madam Principal, Dr. Dinayak, Dr. Professor, Dr. Professor, Sir, welcome to our college for this in our program, of course. And uh, my dear colleagues, esteemed colleagues, um, and everyone, and last but not least, students, uh, welcome to today's program. Uh, on behalf of uh, Ek Bharat, Shrestha Bharat Club of Sri Lanka Commerce College, uh, I extend a warm welcome and greetings to everyone on this auspicious occasion of 152nd birth anniversary of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the nation. And uh, so uh, it goes, um, <clears throat> uh, before we begin with the program, I would like to um, request Ms. Mitali uh, to please come up. And may I request the principal madam to kindly Felicitate our resource person for the day. Give the round of applause. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, we are celebrating his 152nd birth anniversary. And of course, uh, in front of the society, so precious little. <laughs> so it is like we are showing a year to the sun. So uh, I will not do that. But uh, I just feel like that um, Mahatma Gandhi embodies the idea of India. What India stands for. That. And that's why, um, uh, what do you call it? Is uh, Ek Bharat Shrestha Bharat Club. Um, let me just talk a little bit about it. Once it started, uh, once it, you know, this, this uh, program was started in 2015, and uh, it seems all the colleges and institutions are supposed to have one club by the name of Ek Bharat Shrestha Bharat. And the basic objective of this Ek Bharat Srishta Bharat Club is to celebrate the unity and diversity of our nation, promote the spirit of uh, national integration, showcase the rich heritage, culture, customs, and traditions of either states. I think these states are supposed to come together and then establish long term engagements between various stakeholders. States and then lastly, create an environment which promotes learning between the states by sharing best practices. So these are the, uh, the ideals of Lake Arts West Model. And uh, this being the first program, and uh, I'm sure this will not be the last, and we will have a series of programs programs um, uh, in the coming days. So without taking much time. Let me invite uh, Madam Principal to give the welcome speech. Madam. A very pleasant morning to you all. You know, even rains can be pleasant, so I wish you a very pleasant morning. Respect the chairman's concern for the room and the learned professor tonight. Your vice principals, esteemed colleagues, loving students, and all present here today. I extend a hearty welcome to Professor Nayan Chandra and to all of you who have gathered here to celebrate Gandhi Jayanti, the 102nd birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Professor Nanda is so kind of you to agree to come and share your experiences with us. 
I'm sure we will have a lot to take home today. Gandhi Jayanti is celebrated in the on October 2nd to mark the birth of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. The day is also celebrated internationally as International Day of Non Violence, as Gandhi was a lifelong champion of non violence. The light that Gandhi had given to our was no ordinary light. He spread a light that illuminated every corner of the Gandhi proved to be the world on his own, that the path of truth and not violence is the best path. By using these two weapons, he gave freedom to the country. Gandhi gave up his life for the sake of humanity, which he never deviated from the path of his He showed the world to his deeds that service to humanity in the true sense is the only true religion. He believed that an education which does not teach us to discriminate between good and bad, to assimilate the one and to achieve the other is of this form. Education should be a revolutionized as to answer the ones of religion instead of answering those of imperial sport. Literacy itself is no education. Literacy education should follow the education of the world. The one gift that visibly distinguishes man from beast. Gandhi laid on emphasis on the principle of spending every minute of one's life usefully as the best education he saw for himself a unit of what he believed, what he did, and what he said. Creed, deed, and words are one. This is the integration, which is the integrity of truth that he sought for this country and for the citizens of the world, of the global world, as we see today. Significant. Uh, Albert Einstein has made a very significant comment about Mahatma Gandhi. And he once said, Generations to come, if we are wealthy, will scarce believe that such a man as Mahatma Gandhi ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. That Gandhiji was a great man was, ne was never in a doubt. The teasing question is was he a saint? among the politicians or a politician amongst the saints? Now this question has been very aptly answered by late Isaiah Berlin, and I quote, in the realm of action, the great man seems able almost alone and single-handedly to transform one form of life into another or permanently and radically alters the outlook and values of a significant body of human beings. Gandhi, thus is the recognizable great man. He's a safe, he's a self-made man. He made himself great, he was not born great. Gandhiji fought for much more than independence. His causes included civil rights for women, the abolition of the caste system, and fair treatment of all people regardless of religion. Some of his famous quotes, you must be the change if you wish to change the change in the world. An eye for an eye only ends up making the world blind. The greatness of a nation can be judged by, its, by the way its animals are treated. There is more to life than increasing its, its speed. Man is but the product of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes. The best way to find yourself is to use yourself in the service of others. Now, I'm not going to take all of your time here today because we have amongst us Dr. Vinay Lata, who is more an expert on Gandhiji and what Gandhiji stands for and his relevance, especially Gandhi's relevance uh, to the 21st century. Thank you so much. Once, once again, welcome to all of you. Thanks. <laughs>
thank you so much, Matt, for that wonderful wonderful speech. Um, we have the question here. And uh, next in line, we have a dance option, uh, Lahani dance, because this year Nihalia is tagged with Mahasra. So that's why we would like to have something cultural and heritage of Mahasra. So one of our students will be showcasing the uh, Lahani dance from Mahasra. Her name is Karli Sharma from BA and Semester. So, I invite them to make their presentation. Yes. That was uh, short and sweet, of course. Um, uh, then we have an hotel of Monterey Downs um, by IP Mary Antonio. Please make the presentation. Thank <laughs> you. 
various people have remembered him in different ways. His compatriots have loved him, have hated him, from essentially calling him the father, Bapu, as the first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, actually addressed him, or calling him a naked fakir, as Sir Winston Churchill called him. He was undoubtedly a phenomenon. And I thought, as a student of history, which I am in my training and in my practice, I thought it would be good to arm myself with books. I don't much do that. You don't depend on them. You know, the idea is not to spin another story about one. There are three things which I want to tell you. Primarily, in my very short presentation. There's a problem with us, I, I feel, uh, I'm sure colleagues will agree. When uh, teachers take the stage, they don't want to leave. Yeah? And probably after 20, 25 minutes, students start looking at the watch. And I completely agree with the students more than my colleagues. Yeah, that uh, you should look at the watch. When, uh, we go on and on and on talking about um, whatever we have been saying. But Gandhi is a a person who's much larger than life. Man principal started off with Albert Einstein, who actually summed up Gandhi very well. A man who actually was much beyond his age a man who was least understood and much misunderstood during this time. A man born in 1869, and a man who was violently introduced to the idea of violence in South Africa when he was actually confronted with the annual Boer War. Confronted with the idea of violence, the idea of killing, the idea of hatred. By 1899, that was Gandhi's baptism into the realization that the world needed more of violence than violence. And that is why, if you look at his entire experience in South Africa, where he actually went as a lawyer, and experimenting his political experiences and political ideas, you'll probably see that Gandhi was experimenting with the idea of nonviolence and pacifism. First, it's not. It is important to also go back to the influences. You will probably appreciate that when you start talking about any individual. It is important to talk about the person's influences right from time. In fact, there is only a song that gets played every time we remember Bhakti. Rational Janato Te Kente Ne Kanye Pira Padaye Jane Na Jane. Basically, it's a song which was sung by Narsi Mehta. A song that essentially embodied the very essence of what Gandhi believed and practiced. That he did not distinguish between the idea of us and them, something that we are much confronted with today, in today's world. And that is why, when we celebrate Gandhi beyond his 150 years, it's important to probably remember the man his practice and his ideas. When Gandhi came to India, India was actually in the middle of a colonial experience. When Gandhi was born, India was in the middle of a colonial experience. In 1869, India was definitely under the British. And the most interesting element of Gandhi was that Gandhi realized that the kind of 
experiences that you have, historical experiences of Gandhi. Gandhi, will, you people will talk about various movements that he's helped. I've not come here to talk about movements. You know, as you know, for, for those of you who might not have taken history, but you have, at some point of time, if you aspire to have civil services, you know, civil services, you have to engage with this. So just, just let me share with you one or two small things. You know, one of the things that Gandhi realized when he actually came into public life is that the organized machinery of Western civilization was extremely powerful material. And this is very, very important. So therefore, for a country like India, what the, what the colored and the, the non-whites, I don't want to use the word black or, you know, Asian or colored or brown, you know, I don't want to essentially magnify the racist connotations that come with it. But for somebody like that, who was very perceptive, who was basically leading the anti-apartheid, anti-discrimination movement, I realized that the state was very powerful. And so therefore, it would be impossible for him to match materially the state in opposition. So therefore, what he actually went on to understand this, he went on to his early experience. And he realized that the most important element of any life is the idea of God. And so therefore, when you actually look into Gandhi's writings, one of the reasons, one of the most important writings that we should celebrate, you know, a writing that actually first emerged in 1909, is the Hind Swaraj. Hind Swaraj is Gandhi's expression of a political, social, economic vision. We all talk about vision. You know, we had vision 2020, vision 2050. So when you're celebrating the man, it's not just celebrating his life. Of course, you celebrate his life. But you cannot celebrate his ideas without celebrating. Gandhi was a human being. So therefore, when you're talking about Gandhi, you have also celebrated the man and the So when Gandhi started talking about it, he experienced he experienced of oppression. Gandhi was in the of oppression in two levels. One, his existence in colonial that was oppressive. His second experience of oppression was when he went to South Africa as a lawyer. And he realized that not only was South Africa under colonial, South Africa had institutionalized the practice of history to apartheid. And so, therefore, Gandhi decided that he would resist the practice of apartheid, not by violence. But through what he understood and what he developed as passive ways. You know, one of the things that we need to recognize is that it is it's extremely interesting to look at the concept of passive ways. But before we get into the idea of passive resistance, I just want to share with you a small uh, anecdote about. What was basically the way in which he practiced passive resistance in South Africa? See, Gandhi was a non white Gandhi was opposing the practice of Gandhi was opposing the practice of discrimination. And so let us see how Gandhi experienced and reacted discrimination in South Africa. You know, we talk about Gandhi as a modern thinking that probably Gandhi experienced and experimented with all his ideas in India. South Africa was Gandhi's first laboratory of passive resistance. Incidentally, we all are part of the Gandhi's 
the first vice chancellor of the North East City University, CBS Vivanasa, was a person who had written a fantastic book on Mahatma Gandhi called The Making of the Mahatma And I expect what I'm sharing with you from his book. Vivanasa writes, and this is, uh, you know, his experience of how does he deal with the mob? The mob followed them, increased with every step, Bandhi and Lord Brought him to his pain in South Africa. So the mob increased with every step that Bandhi was taking. The mob now became private. Gandhi kept what? His ears filled with zeers and catcalls and his clothes spattered with mud, stained fish, rotten eggs. A man snatched off his turban. You know, in those days, people used to have turban. I don't know whether you've seen photographs of old, uh, you know, old photographs from our old place, the Khasi Jaiti. You'd see people wearing turbans. People still wear turbans in certain occasions. Uh, in, in our, our part of the world, in among, the, among our community. A man snatched off his turban. Another hit him with a riding whip. A burlish fellow shouting, are you that man who wrote to the press and kicked him from behind? Shoved him to one side of the street. Gandhi held on desperately to the rain of he was bleeding and out of breath as the crowd continued to battle. Throughout the trial procession, his manliness could not be suppressed. And I can assure Natal that's where Gandhi actually experienced his and experimented with his ideas as a And I can assure Natal that he's a man who must be treated. Now please excuse the masculine, uh, you know, in, in a gender-friendly world, please excuse the masculine expression that we see out there. Extremely patriarchal, very masculine. Leaving aside the masculinity of the language, let us first start by admiring the practice of what we do in this you could have taken the words to law if you wanted. But he decided to resist it through the idea of violence. Now, that is the first experience that I share. We are talking about this man who was not only preaching on violence preaching fascism, but also practicing in a very different way. And that is why we must celebrate Gandhi because we are celebrating a man who practiced what he preached. If you want to change the world, you have to call the next. That is the first reason we want to celebrate Gandhi beyond that. There are a lot of us. Actually, you know, there are many times I walk into the class and I say, Well, you must be very, very attentive in class. There are many times when I know as a student I do not hold on to my attention. There are many times when I wanted to bump the class. But I often come down very hard on students. But the point is that the man must be respected for walking the talk that he gave. And that is the first reason why Mahatma Gandhi celebrated. So hence, celebrating the man, celebrating not only his heritage, but come to his heritage, celebrating him. The second important thing that we probably need to acknowledge. We probably take democracy and mass politics almost as granted. 
today when you start talking about politics, you invariably can't even think about politics without elections, without mass politics, without participation, participation of the community. When Gandhi came to India, came back from South Africa, he was confronted with the reality of politics being very elite. Essentially, politics being the preserve of only the exclusive. It's not that there was no resistance against colonialism. We know that by 1904, 1905, you have what is called the Swadeshi movement. Before that, you have in, for example, the Khasi and Jainis, the emergence of resistance movements. You have Yang Mawla, who actually led a resistance against cultural resistance in Northeast India. To be more familiar, we can talk about the same thing. So it's not that resistance was not there. But political resistance was essentially in the hands of an exclusive. Very few people. Mind you, out of 30 crores of people, not even 3,000 people were in the politics. That is the situation where Gandhi actually landed in. And Gandhi realized that if you actually need to change from colonialism to independence, you need to have the people. And as I say, like two other people before him, the first thing that Gandhi did was he actually decided to move across the country, go to the people where he wanted to initiate the change. So three people, three places, essentially become very important. Champaran, Khera, and Amadar. And Gandhi decided to go there and study what was the problem. And then he realized that invariably, unless you put the middle of mid workers, unless you put the peasants with you, in other words, unless you put the common people, the farmers and the laborers, you cannot be the leader of a successful anti-colonial movement. Otherwise, anti-colonial movement will only be a discussion in some room like this. So what he did was, he began to tell the people that if they wanted to change the situation that they did, they must actually participate in the change. And the second thing is that, but he did not want them to be violent. He said that you have to be non-violent because you cannot tactically match the colonial state material. You do not have enough guns to go and compete against the colonial state, to put it in very blunt language. So therefore, passive resistance, non-violent resistance, not violent resistance. It's not that he was compromising with something that he did not believe. Gandhi never once believed in compromising with the colonial. So if you do not believe in the system, most of us compromise. But Gandhi decided to resist it. So therefore resistance was there. But the nature of his resistance was there. It was non-violent resistance. And Gandhi was very categorical. He said that nonviolence is not the method of the weak. Because there are only two things that can happen to go violent. One, you have to be materially strong enough to compete with your opponent. And the second, you have to realize that the violent cost of violence will be too big for you to manage it. In fact, 
when Gandhi called out the non-cooperation movement, Gandhi was extremely criticized by people who were his friends. People like Nehru, people like Vallabhai Patel, people who had joined him. And when Gandhi was asked, why is it that he called out the non-cooperation movement? Just because the mob went and put the police station on fire. Just because 22 policemen were killed as a result of that violence that happened at Chauri Chauhan. Gandhi's answer was very, very categorical. He says, I would suffer every humiliation. I would suffer every torture. I would suffer every absolute ostracism. You know, there are, ostracism is something which is extremely dangerous. You can kill people, but if you say that I socially I am going to boycott you, ostracism means social boycott. That is very dangerous. Gandhi said he is even willing to risk that and even death to prevent the movement from becoming violent. And then he says, suppose the non-violent disobedience of Bardoli was, was permitted by God to succeed. The India government had abdicated in favor of the victors. Who would control the unruly element? So the problem is not in becoming violent. The problem is in controlling violence. Once you become violent, and Gandhi was aware of the limitations of going by. You know, friends, one of the most interesting things that we face in today's world is violence. Every day, there are various kinds of violence that we face. There is no end to the kind of violent experiences because we do not know how to control violence. Gandhi was aware about the problems of going violent. And that is why he said, what will happen if you go violent? How do you control it? And because you do not know how to control it, let us not succumb to the temptation of going violent. Firstly, you cannot materially match the state by going violent. And secondly, you do not know how to control violence once you understand. So therefore, Gandhi was undoubtedly, he was sure he was saying, he was definitely more pragmatic than most of the other people who were his combatants. I now turn to some of his ideas which are extremely relevant. Friends, I want to, in this context, not just focus on his practice. I've, I've shared with you two very, very different examples, one from South Africa, the other from uh, India. And the reason why I shared this experience, South Africa was his laboratory of passive resistance. The non-cooperation movement was his laboratory of experiencing his movement in India, a very, very large scale mass movement in India. Why should the man be remembered? Because he actually made the movement into a mass movement. That independence should be the vision that you and I can see. Not only people who are exclusive, but people like you and me, that we should all believe that we can live in an independent country, that we share the dream of independence. That is something that Gandhi actually practiced with us. So Gandhi needs to be remembered because he brought masses into politics. He held our hand and he showed us how to be part of a movement against oppression, against injustice. But how could we be part of that movement without becoming violent? The other reason why we remember Gandhi. Of course, we get into the ideas. I say, once you allow uh, you know, a teacher to start talking, you go on. So I'll probably take about five, seven. Am I allowed to take that five, seven? 
no, no, uh, sir, please be free to tell me, sir, why I'm in five minutes. Uh, you know, uh, as Dan would know, that, you know, for people like us, we can go on. So that's that's not something that I want you to hold first day. I'll just tell you the other reason why we invariably, right from childhood, we remember Gandhi. As a young boy, I remember Gandhi for the holiday that he comes to. I remember Gandhi because I had working parents. So that was the day when both my parents would invariably be at home. It was a great idea. You know, when, you're parents, when you're a child, it's a great idea when parents are at home. Yeah? That's when you are a child. So, uh, but today, as I stand here, or probably when at, at an age when I, which I am in, no, Gandhi looks like a phenomenon. And the other reason why Gandhi, apart from the nonviolence that I've shared with you, Gandhi's techniques, Gandhi's ideas, the practice of it, that Gandhi should be remembered is for essentially making us fearless. And Gandhi said that nonviolence is not the weapon of the weak. If you are weak in heart, or if you are weak in conviction, or if you do not believe in yourself, you cannot be nonviolent. Violence is invariably a weapon of the weak. And Gandhi made us believe that, that violence is the weapon of the weak. Now let me just go back to history and just tell you. The thousands of people went to jails after 1921 because they were all part of the Gandhian movement. Be it the non cooperation movement, be it the civil disobedience movement, 29-32, be it the Quit India movement, or be it many other movements. One of the things that invariably strikes my mind as a student is you can enthuse so many people to go to jail. It must be fantastic. Because you lose the fear of oppression. Gandhi gave us the lesson of fear. That if you really believe that you want to resist oppression, if you really believe that you want to be on the side of truth, then you must be fearless. Whatever be the consequences, even if it means that the oppressor will oppress you more and more, even if, you, even if it means that you have to face torture or social ostracism, you have to Because you believe in truth. Gandhi said that there is no distinction between Truth and nonviolence. You can only be nonviolent if you are morally, ethically, truthfully there. So, in, in, the, in the idea of politics, one of the most important contributions of Gandhi is the introduction of ethics. Not politics for the sake of power. The idea is not to essentially go and become, you know, in those days, in the 1920s, member of the Legislative Council. The idea was not, post-1935, become a member of the Legislative Assembly. Gandhi was not a member of either the Legislative Assembly or the Legislative Council or the Imperial Council. But all the viceroys invariably had to negotiate with Gandhi. So when you're celebrating a man like that, you realize the power of truth. You realize that if you are on the side of truth, you become fearless. But most importantly, at least in the limited context of politics as a game of power, that if you really believe in the power of truth, power will run after you and you don't have to run. This is something that Gandhi is like. And that is why we celebrate that. I think it's important to talk about some of these ideas. 
There are two things that we are probably confronted with. Three things actually. Post the 73rd, 73rd Amendment, Panchayati Act. Yeah. We are invariably talking about Panchayats. The crux, the core of the Panchayat is a village. And Gandhi essentially believed in empowering villages. One of the things, friends, that we probably see that when we start talking about our experience of modern life is the rise of metropolises. Why is it that people, you know, the, the population of Shillong has increased? The, the, the character of the town has increased? Today, what initially started off with police bazaar and with, you know, extended from Mokha to Dantra, that was the extent of the town. Yeah. And if you go back to colonial records, they will tell you Laram and Rajita village. Yeah. Laban village. These are some of the records that will excuse me for going back to archival records, huh? my training. But invariably, one of the things that you today see, you're talking about new township. Why is it that you're talking about new township? Because the population has increased. You need more space. But what does actually the expansion of the town tell you? Apart from the fact that more and more buildings are coming up, apart from more and more people are coming in. Earlier, we knew each other in the locality. Now we don't know each other. Yeah? We have all the institutions, but we don't know each other. If somebody is dying, who's, in, who's your neighbor? Thanks to COVID, we don't even know. We now know we don't have to go and see the past. Distance, social distance, physical distance, but the most important thing, mental and psychological distance. But anyway, but the most interesting thing that we have to remember is that the expansion of the city might be great, you know, water shortage, electricity shortage, crisis in various forms. But what does it tell you? It tells you that we have not done enough for the villages. More and more people are coming from the rural areas into the urban areas. And hence, a crisis that initially was small is becoming magnified more and more. Gandhi, do you read Gandhi? You will be surprised that the man was so very, very sagacious. And he knew that unless we actually empower villages, we won't be landing ourselves in what is called the crisis of modernity. Gandhi, a letter to Jawaharlal Nehru, was extremely categorical. One of, one of his letters that he writes to Nehru, I don't know for very long. Just, I wanted to share this letter, uh, not to Nehru actually. He writes this very interesting letter in 1909, the same year that he wrote the Hing Swaraj, this book. This is his political testament, as people say. So, in the same year that he wrote this book, he wrote to his friend Henry Pollock about how he situation in the world. And he said, there is no such thing as Western or European civilization. There is a modern civilization. And now they realized that modern civilization, modernity, might be empowering, but it also is the beginning, the root, the germ of a many crises. So one of the things that he realized that he probably spoke about village, you know. So his ideas of village governance, the idea of Swaraj, is something that is fantastic. You know, today when you see the expansion of the town, we probably do not reflect enough to realize that it reflects the crisis in the village. How many people wanted to stay in the village? And over a period of time, 
as more and more people have shifted to the urban center, the village essentially has become a negative connotation. Today, if you actually go back to our communities, they will invariably say, if you're from the village, they say, oh, no kingdom. Yeah, which in other words means that you're not from the urban settlement. There is no greatness attached to urbanity. But what is very, very interesting is that today, because we have created the crisis in the village, we invariably attach so much of importance to the town. Gandhi realized this. So he said, his ideas of village Swaraj when he was asked, and this he explained in 1942, my idea of village Swaraj is that it is com it's a complete republic, independent of its neighbors for its own vital wants. Now, many people have stopped just here. So Gandhi was talking about village isolation, village republic. And Gandhi says, and yet interdependent for many others in which dependence is a necessity. So Gandhi was very pragmatic. Gandhi was not unpragmatic. He realized that the villages needed to be strengthened. But at the same time, when you strengthen the village, it does not necessarily mean that the village loses its connection with its surroundings. So Gandhi, advocated a very curious mix of dependence and independence. And it is only when you know how to balance dependence and independence that you can have harmony. Gandhi advocated actually social, political, and economic harmony. The other idea, I will, I will talk to two other ideas and I'll close up the presentation. The other idea that Gandhi spoke about was Swadeshi. Swadeshi, in its understanding, is not something that was novel to Gandhi. But Gandhi was a very religious man. As a person who was devoutly Hindu, as a person who was steeped in Vaishnavite tradition, Gandhi had read the Gita. So Gandhi invariably went back to one of the verses of the Gita, which says, Swadham and Idhanamish. It's better to die within one's own dharma. And this is Sanskrit phrase. Swadhar means nidhanam shreya. Nidhan means die. It's better. Shreya means good. It's, it's good to die within, one, within one's own dharma. So therefore, Gandhi was actually talking about sustenance within one's own settings. Today, one of the major crises that we face is because of globalization. We are dependent on a lot of things. We are dependent on our thoughts, for our, on, on others for our thoughts. Yeah? I, I can actually throw up a challenge. If tomorrow I want to say that each one of you come in traditional clothes, yeah? For across the board, whether it's a Bengali, whether it's an Assamese, whether it's a Khasi Jayanti, yeah? you know, if you go back to old pictures, you will see people wearing a dhoti. If you go back home, you will not find a dhoti. Yeah? So the compromise that we have is we wear kurta paja. So every, every time you are told come in traditional clothes, you wear kurta paja. So therefore, Gandhi was one person who actually advocated sustenance of the self, sustenance of the surrounding by advocating Swadeshi. Because Swadeshi was not just a political slogan. Swadeshi was the means by which you can sustain your own industries, your own commerce, your own production process. So therefore, when you talk about the Khadi and village industries, when Gandhi was talking about charkha, spinning, he was talking about sustenance of the grassroots. So therefore, Gandhi, in this sense, the idea of Swadeshi. Swaraj, I have already said, the idea of independence. Gandhi definitely said that we need Swaraj. But probably, we do not either have the means or probably the ethical legitimacy to go in for violent. So therefore, he advocated non-violence. 
There are two small points which are actually relevant for us in today's world when we are talking about them. And this is something that attracted me a lot when I actually decided uh, that I would, I was honored and I would, th I thought that I, I think I should come and share some of those points. Today you have what is called the new education policy. Yeah. I'm, I'm not very really sure whether you have the first semester here or whether you, you would, uh, but you will you'll be confronted with the new education policy. And one of the most interesting elements of the new education policy is vernacular education. So when Gandhi was asked, what was his thoughts on education? Gandhi said that it is not just about learning the letters. Education is much more. In the last so many years, we've completely forgotten about either deeper education, ethical education. We are only being trained for jobs. Jobs are important, but it's also important to be ethical. So Gandhi stressed a lot on ethical education because we probably forget, right from people like Vivekananda right to up to Gandhi, or to your teachers or our teachers. Now, we expect everybody to be a good human being. We don't teach them how to become one. So therefore, this crisis of ethics is inbuilt in the system of education. So that is one thing that Gandhi was conscious of. So invariably, he advocated ethical education and vernacular education. But did it essentially mean giving up learning how to be connected to the global? He said, no. You invariably need to adopt a three-tier language. So English education, then he spoke about Hindi, a universal language for India. This is Gandhi's words, not mine. And then he spoke about Varnaki. And one of the most important, you know, whatever the, the political persuasions that we might be having, one of the most interesting elements of the new education policy is this three-tier language system inbuilt within the idea of new education policy. So vernaculars, the national language, and English as the link language. So therefore, this is something that can be drawn to 1909. Look at it. We are talking about it in 2020, 2021. We are still struggling how to implement it. Here is a man who is actually writing about it in 1909. Relevance of the man beyond 100 years. You know, if we actually want to work the change, we have to read more of the man. I want to close uh, my presentation. Uh, you know, people say you save the best for the last. I save the most difficult for the last. One of the most uh, difficult realities that we face in today's world is inter-community conflict. There are two ways of dealing about it. Dealing with it. One, don't talk about it. So things which are uncomfortable, sweep it under the carpet and think that they don't exist. That is the ostrich approach. Yeah? If, you, if you actually know how an ostrich would face a, an attack of a lion, you know how would an ostrich face an attack of a lion? He would invariably dig the ground, put his head inside the ground, thinking that because he can't see the danger, the danger does not exist. And then the lion would come and heat up the person. That is one approach. The other approach is to engage with the reality and move beyond it. In the context of uh, 
Gandhi. Gandhi was a person who was invariably confronted with the realities of communal enterprise. And Gandhi says, and that he says in 1909, India cannot cease to be one nation because people belonging to different religions in India. It, it holds good for every locality that we live. Yeah? One of the biggest challenges that we face in 21st century is intolerance. Social intolerance, more so communal intolerance. The greatest respect that we can have for this man who we call the father of the nation is to actually read Hind Swaraj. Not because of the fact that we are trying to deify the man and call him a saint, but because he was definitely more pragmatic than many of us do. You know, we are surrounded by huge water bodies, the Bay of Bengal on one side, the Arabian Sea on the other, you know, the Indian Ocean down south. If we had a choice, we would probably kill each other and dump them in, into uh, the oceans. That's not an option. So therefore, we must adopt the Gandhi idea. And Gandhi says that India cannot cease to be a nation because people here belong to different religions. And he says, Remember that we did not cease to fight, but Hindus flourished under Muslim Soviets. Muslims under the Hindus. Each party recognized that mutual fighting was suicide. So therefore, I think today when we celebrate the man and his 52nd birth anniversary, we need to realize that antagonism and violence is suicidal. We need to learn how to exist with each other. We need to learn that Gandhi is relevant, not just because he is part of the curriculum. He is relevant because he was definitely more pragmatic than any of us today. And that is the relevance of the man. So today, 152 years, 151 years after the man came down to this earth. Yeah? 1869, 20, 21. We need to probably remember that the wise are those who first read what the wise men tell us. But the wiser are those who invariably read and follow what the wise men tell us. Yeah. That is the need, the relevance of Gandhi beyond 150 years of his life. I must thank the college for giving me an opportunity. As I say, I, I promised that I would speak for a short time. I, I was given the copy of uh, the program, you know, in advance. I know that the program is supposed to close by around 12, 10, 12, 15. It's about 12, 30. So as I said, you know, never get a teacher. You go on and on and on speaking. But thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, as I say, there are many aspects of Gandhi and thought which I've not been able to do like myself. I wish I can. Yeah? But my appeal to you is let us start the process because a work well begun is half done. So let us celebrate the man on his 52nd anniversary. Not for what he said, not for the way in which he led, but the way in which his life is an example for us and his thoughts are as relevant for us today as it was when he walked the earth on the inflation line. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful session of yours.
Uh, I have uh, absolutely nothing to say. Of course, you have covered every aspect, and each aspect is equally or you know equally important in so far as we are concerned. Um, of course, uh, and Diji also was you know the, what we have this much of Bharat scheme that we are having now. That is also we have borrowed that idea from him. Twinness, you know, that it is, it is also important, so relevant to this time. So, once again, thank you so much, sir. And uh, as uh, Sir has said, that uh, if you could uh, invite some of the qualities, some of the his thoughts in our life, personal life, we will go along with it. So, before we go for the uh, to close the closing of the program, I would request uh, Sir Anthony to play the bhajan that. Um, for the Prime Minister, we would like actually that is Sir Hassan Mehta, which is Nasim Mehta. So we would like to just listen to that before we wind up. So there was, it should have been at the beginning, but somehow we missed it. So now we would like at least before we close it. Mandi pukare Thank you. 
on behalf of Shillong Women's College and the EBSB Club of Shillong Women's College, I now give the vote of thanks on this uh, special occasion, the 152nd birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Okay. I think we can all agree that we just had an interesting and information session to be reminded of Gandhi as a man, his values, his teachings, and his struggles. For even if we know Gandhiji, we don't actually have an intimate knowledge of him. So I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our resource person, Dr. Afi, resource person, Dr. Binay Dr. for giving us such an opportunity of relearning who Gandhiji was. Thank you, sir, for sparing your valuable time to be with us here today on this auspicious occasion of Gandhi Jayanti. Your speech will be a great source of knowledge to our students. They will need this knowledge throughout their well building their career. It will be every competitive exams, whatever they do in the future. Okay, thank you, sir, once again. May God bless you. I also express my sincere thanks to our beloved principal, Madam Sabita Sen, for her tireless efforts and her valuable suggestions to make this program possible today. Thank you, ma'am, for your endless support and guidance. I also thank our chairperson, Mr. Bob Ram Obadia. Thank you for chairing the session. A big thank you to all the teachers who effortlessly worked to make this program possible today. Sir Anthony and your team for organizing the program. Sir Mantre for helping, always helping us with the technical aspects of any virtual program. Uh, Ms. B2 and Ms. Mitali for doing their report hearing, Ms. Ailad, and also Ms. Palma who's helping us with the feedback forms. And always also thank the non-teaching staff for the help that they have rendered to us. A big thank you also goes to our student participants for their wonderful dance performance, which have given this program a cultural feeling. Thank you, Yali and IT Mary. You did a wonderful job today. Both of you were amazing. Finally, I would like to thank the audience who are present here with us and those who are present virtually. Thank you for your valuable presence. Once again, I thank each and everyone, and I wish you all happy and new times. Be a change that you want to see in the world. Thank you, Ms. Anna. And I think with that, we come, we come to the close of this, of this program. So thank you so much once again from my side also. Uh, so the program is thank you. <laughs>